le gros brouillard. It's very foggy. It's been like that for the last two days. Can't see a thing. There's no sun, no moon. It's kind of sad. The birds are all gone. But we're nearing Cape Horn, and that's what counts. Cape Horn is Bon Populaire's next objective. There's still a complicated wind zone to get through, and then all should be good until the Cape Horn. We should cross before Christmas if all goes well. At the head of the race, the sixth week of the Vendée Globe ends in grayness, and despite appearances, there are grounds for the leader to rejoice. In the middle of the Pacific South, Armé Leclerc takes a powder, much to Alex Thompson's distress, on whom we know the touch of dejection. Unfortunately for me, uh, good for Armel, Bank Populaire is now in a different system. He's done a great job. He managed to cross a little area of, uh, of light winds and get into, into a weather system which I can't get to. I mean, if, if he'd been even 50 miles behind where he was, he wouldn't have made it. But he's made it, and, uh, and so it looks like he's going to be about two days ahead of me. Perhaps slightly more at the horn, depending on how my route goes. So, again, uh, not, uh, not great in terms of looking for winning the race. Far from the Brit, 1,500 kilometers away, it's for the third place that a duel is raging between Jeremy Bayou and Paul Meya. These two have been inseparable for the last 20 days, and while crossing swords, they take in depressions one after the other. There's a lot of wind again today. Up to 45 knots a little while ago. Becoming tiring to sail under these conditions. Let's hope it won't last too long. Noiselessly, Jean-Pierre Dic is steaming ahead. His detour through the Bass Strait between Australia and Tasmania to avoid heavy weathers turned out to pay off. The Saint-Michel Bierbach skipper bounced over the northwest to outflank Jan Elias and seized the fifth place. This is the morning of the 42nd day of the race. The very same day, December 18th, Thomas Ruillon is halfway between Tasmania and New Zealand. For the last 24 hours, he's been trying to avoid a huge depression involving 60 to 70 knots winds. So here are the actual conditions. Got peaks more than 50 knots. There, got high C, and I'm going a little too fast. I'm catching up on the depression, and I don't wish to. Just rolled my J3, just got three reefs in the mainsail. And I think I'm going to go on like that for the next 10, 12 hours. Thomas wants to be cautious and sails seamen like a route badly paid. Eighth in the latest ranking, he's clearly put the competition in parentheses. The previous evening in 10th position, 700 miles south of Australia, Stéphane Le Diraison was also sailing cautiously in 25 knots winds with two reefs in the mainsail miles away from imagining his boat with dismast. In spite of a deep, abyssal disappointment, Stefan's mind very quickly got back at it. Here, we see the only part of the mast I kept on board. It's the first meter of the mast. That's it, I prepared the main boom, which I'll use as mast. And in orange here are my shrouds, there are the halyards and the strut. And I'm about to hoist. Here's my pretty jury rig I'm very proud of. This jury rig should allow Stéphane, while sailing at low speed and with great patience, to reach Melbourne before the end of the year. Still in the Indian Ocean approaching Cape Lewin, Eric Bellion brings up the rear of the group just out of a depression. The commun seul homme skipper, happier than ever, doesn't tire thanking his boat for having brought him so far. Je t'aime, mon bateau. I love you, my boat.
This is a particular moment for my boat and I, where I check daily and I know everything's fine. I tell it how much I love it, and I even kiss it too, because we've got such a relationship, we two. I'm so lucky to have this beautiful boat. We have an extraordinary relationship. It's indulgent with me. It's got an extraordinary inner strength and only wants to finish the Vendée Globe. At the head of the same group as Eric Bellion, out of the same depression, Fabrice Amedeo has got some of his fingers burned. We had up to 50 knots at the head of the front, and so the mainsail tore. It's really tough for the morale. It means we're dragging on. I'm waiting for an opening to start the repair, but I have the impression there's always wind in this country. It's complicated. Michel de Joyeux, a year and a half ago, had told me, you'll see, the Vendée Globe, it's a hassle a day. I had answered, really? Well, I confirmed. We're right in the statistics. So now I'm trying to recover the lead, set myself in order of battle, and mostly I've got to fix this mainsail. But say, keeping it in perspective, we're in the game for the world around, and to make it back to the Sable d'Olonne, there are many who aren't so lucky. The shock was violent. I'm still shivering. The mere thought of it. Talking about it. The hall is split open. The chine bulkheads are coming loose all over. I was at 17, 18 knots. I think I hit a container. That's what tore the hull's bottom and blasted the whole front of the boat. The boat folded, literally. Voilà. That's it, end of the Vendée Globe. It's over. One half of a world around. I'm so disappointed it ends this way. I mean, I had problems. My share of hassle. But this one, darn that one, I don't wish it to anyone. Message to Thomas Ruyant. I want you to know that I'm with you with all my heart. Those things happen. Damn it, it happened to me and it will happen again. It's our job. Special thanks to you for the quality of your navigation skills and for the pleasure I felt of having an opponent of your level. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. Thomas has no end but to save his boat, which could break apart at any time now. So he sets off towards Bluff, the closest harbor south of New Zealand and within 48 hours of navigation. With the help of the Coast Guards, he'll succeed in taking up this ultimate challenge. In the South Seas, depressions never stop. There, this is what it looks like. Do you see the wall that's right behind? There? Wow, the waves, I don't know, but they're big. There are 40 knots. 45 in the gusts. And it's been like that for three days. So, I'm cutting out, moving northwards. Heading north because there's an even greater depression due on Wednesday. So, I'm hurrying getting out of the way. It increases my route, but I got no choice. Hot. 50 to 55 knots winds are expected. So, such as Romain Tanazio at Fleet's Tail, all are preparing to lay low following a route that's more northwards. Uh, the weather is improving. It uh, has been uh, a little bit wild. 
look at the uh, look at what is behind the boat. Here it goes. Bye. Much ahead, on the 44th day of the race on Cape Lewin's longitude, we hear of an incredible traffic jam. Within 15 hours' time, five competitors will have crossed the second of the three capes. First, Fabrice Amedeo, Alan Brouard, Endel Coinin, Rich Wilson, and Eric Bayon. Here's Rich Wilson, it's great! That's it! Cape Lewin! Wow, gosh, it's cool! Eric Bellion, blissfully happy, while Paul Meya would have preferred not to chill the atmosphere. Very bad news today. I heard a great bang. and the keel started moving. And then I noticed there was a problem with the ram. Went to take a closer look. There was oil all over. Then I realized the ram was cracked. And that can't be fixed. I hooked up the keel so it's not too loose. I hope it'll hold off. Pomeya is in the middle of a maritime desert, close to the Point Nemo, the ocean point the furthest from the nearest land, the closest land being at 2,700 kilometers. The SMA skipper hasn't officially declared his abandon, but evidently can't continue the race under such conditions. Out of 29 competitors at the start, 19 are still in the race. A negative conclusion in principle, but as sociologist Paul Yonet rightly underlined, isn't that what makes the Vendée Globe so exciting to observe? We see in real time and in pure state how a sporting event disintegrates and subsides to reach another dimension of a human challenge. So when Armel Leclerc, leading the race, crosses the Cape Horn after 47 days at sea and in solitude, he only adds to the extreme ordeals legend revealing a strength of character, a will, and an uncommon intelligence.